Welcome to Crush Gasm, the podcast dedicated to the highs and lows of crushes. From their first to their worst, we're going to cover them all with a cascade of characters, including our guest today, someone who claims to have been faking sanity since 1982, James Flynn, a book reviewing YouTuber, artist, and author who is here to talk not only about his new book of short stories, The Hand That Pulls You Under, but also his crush on a character who is known for being a natural-born killer. And of course, we're talking about Mallory Knox, played by the wonderful and always entertaining Juliette Lewis. James, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Now, I have to admit, as much as I love the 90s, I'm a 90s kid, I have never seen this movie. So I did have to watch it when you told me who your crush was. I was like, all right, it's streaming on HBO Max. I'm going to watch it. And whoa, this is a wild ride. It and it's sure even is. and it's even yeah. like wilder to me that you were watching this at like 11, 12 years old. Now, did you grow up in a house that had like some rules or were you like, nah, we could do whatever we want and you watched it? Um, I could do whatever I liked when I was younger. Um, however, I didn't actually watch this film until the early 2000s. Oh, okay. So by that time, this film came out in 94, didn't it? And, mm -hmm. and so by the time I watched it, I think it was, it was, almost, it was already about seven years old or so. Um, uh -huh. And at that time, I was about 19, I think. Um, Okay, so, so you weren't watching yeah. it at like 11. <laughs> no, but okay. on the other hand, I was watching other like violent films at the time. So I, I was allowed to watch that kind of stuff. I just didn't get around to watching this one until I was a bit older. Right. Now, did this movie in any way shape how you approached writing and art? Because there's some pretty like interesting art elements to this movie that I never even knew about because obviously I'd never seen it until like a week ago. <laughs> Oh, well, I would actually describe this film as a work of art. I don't know whether you noticed when you watched it the other day, but it, it is just packed full of like subliminal images and clips. It, it's, there's just so much stuff crammed into it. You know, the film constantly goes from black and white to colour. And there, there's actually a secret meaning to that, I think. I, I think when it goes to black and white, it's supposed to represent the, the character's inner thoughts or something like that. But um, it's, it's filmed in such a creative way. You know, every few seconds you get these little images flashing up on the screen. And uh, there's, so, there's so much kind of symbolism in the film that I would actually describe it as art. It was actually written by Quentin Tarantino, by the way. I don't know if you know that. I do. My husband is a very big Tarantino fan, so I do know what he's done. I've just been seeing them slowly over the years since we've gotten together, though. He's not someone I watched on my own. I think the only movie I seen before I started dating my guy was um, Django Unchained. Oh, I haven't seen that one. I That's really good. That. Is it? Yeah, I, I might, I might watch that. Um, really long. It, oh right, okay. Maybe but worth not it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's really long, but you kind of don't you get lost in it. But it, it maybe could have used maybe forty five minutes less, give or yeah, take. <laughs> yeah, and well, yeah, and that applies to his newest film as well. Um, Once upon a time in Hollywood. So oh yeah, that was long. Seen that one? Yeah. That is way too long, way too long. That could be condensed to about 90 minutes, I think. But yeah, Tarantino wrote this. He, he wrote Natural Born Killers. Yeah, I was like, that's kind of like the same plot. Kind of like, well, generally, it's like two people in love and going on their thing. And I was like, this guy, maybe he had like a, an obsession with the couple thing. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. Uh, apparently, Tarantino's screenplay of this film um, Mickey and Mallory actually played quite a, a minor role in it. They, they were just like two kind of two-dimensional characters and you didn't really get to find out much about them. But when Oliver Stone decided to, to make the movie, he completely changed it and he decided to kind of really um, give a big background to, to Mickey and Mallory's uh, history and, and kind of delve into their character. So he made a big change to it. And I don't think Tarantino like, likes the film, by the way. No, he said he hated it. I was reading up yeah. on it and he hated it. But I think, uh, to going back to your crush on Juliette Lewis, like, 
I'm not really a fan of hers per se, but when I turn this on within like minutes, I love this character. I thought her backstory was great and I felt for her. I was like rooting for her in a way, even though I know she's like killing people, but still like, I think the first couple kills were justified. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like, what was it about this character when you watched other than maybe like some hormones, of course, that you like? about her oh she she just plays the character so well doesn't she um mm -hmm. she's like as soon as you see that opening scene where, where she's like dancing in the, in the cat she, she's just like uh well she dances well for a start she, she's got some good dance moves <laughs> i would say um and she everything about her is just kind of free and easy in the film she, she just kind of she's made for the role almost and um you see her with blonde hair in the film as well. I'm not sure whether she's even my type or not in real life, but you know, in, when I saw her in this film, it kind of changed things. I think the first film I saw with Juliette Lewis was, was actually Cape Fear. Have you seen that one? No. I'm not like Cape a big Fear. scary movie person. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, she, she plays a lot of um, weird roles actually. She's quite famous for that. The but, first um, movie um, I ever seen her in was a year prior to this. It was What's Eating Gilbert Grape with Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. I think he was nominated okay. for an Oscar for that. Yeah, it came out a year prior and a very different role from this movie. <laughs> so she's got right. range. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's got range. Or maybe she's just um, moved on from her kind of controversial <laughs> stage. I don't know. I was going to say, you said that Mallory's not really the type of girl you would go for in real life. So I was going to ask, like, did you like more rebellious girls growing up or not? Uh, maybe you didn't. Um, Obviously not this rebellious, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking more yeah. like maybe they shoplifted. <laughs> maybe they shoplifted. Um, yes, I suppose. Um, I suppose there's a kind of appeal there for like rebellious character I mean I, I, I didn't really do that well with, with girls when I was younger I mean in primary school it was like non-existent for me I was just too too timid I didn't have the confidence and in secondary school there were a few girls there who I liked and yeah I suppose they were kind of like the louder girls the class maybe so there was that kind of link there but again i, I was way too i, I lacked the confidence in, in school i didn't start dating girls until i was like until i'd left school i'm i'm honestly same boat a lot of people that come on this show we're all in that same boat <laughs> i think maybe it's yeah. like an art a creative thing like we're too shy the shy artist type possibly possibly but yes but you say you were shy, but you were also kind of a rebel yourself back in the day because you got into graffiti as a teen and then you kind of had some run in with the law. Like, do you think you could have like handled dating someone like Mal? Maybe not just like Mallory. Yeah, she was a spree killer, but like someone rebellious like that, if you had the confidence because you had the you had a rebellious nature to you. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, you know, when I, when I left school at 16, I kind of became a, a bit of a, a rebel like that. I, I got in, heavily involved in like the, the London graffiti scene. And you know, that was my life for years. I used to go out doing graffiti every weekend. And I got arrested for it a few times. Yeah, I, I got in trouble and stuff. But um, yeah, there, there, was, there was a stage where I probably would have got on with, with Mallory, I think. I wasn't up to her level, as you say, but yeah, it, it might have worked. Like a little, a couple notches down, but still like <laughs> rebellious. Um, is UK graffiti that scene kind of similar to like American graffiti, like the style? Yes. Well, it, it was in the nineties anyway. That the whole graffiti thing, I, I think it started in New York, didn't it? In the in the nineteen eighties, that was like the, the big um, heyday, and then. That kind of started seeping over to to England in the 90s. So it's really weird. Like in the 1990s, you had like people living out in the suburbs of London, 
but they were kind of into this like New York graffiti culture. And like every weekend, you used to get loads of like uh, loads of teenagers just like going onto train tracks and doing these paintings and stuff, and, and like breaking into train depots and painting trains and stuff. It's it like really crazy. I, I got heavily involved in that stuff. Yeah. Did it have any correlation to do with hip hop as well over there? Like it did maybe over here? Well, um, hip hop is big in America. In in England, it was all about drum and bass. Mm. It, uh, dance music was more popular. Um, UK garage and drum and bass was, was more popular, I'd say. But but you, people were definitely aware of, of um, like the big hip hop. Uh, songs and stuff as well. Well, a big aspect of hip hop is like that whole ride or die thing. Like, you know, me and my boo, she's ride or die, gonna be here forever. And that's kind of what Mallory was to Woody Harrelson's character. Like, she was all in for that guy. And even like he went to prison, she's like, no, I'm gonna wait for you. You're always gonna find me. Would you say that's like part of the attraction to her? Yeah, she's she's a big rebel and um, she's, she's certainly loyal as well, yeah. She was, she was loyal to the very end. But one one thing I really enjoyed as well, which is worth mentioning, is um, you see her her childhood in such a good way in the film, don't you? That it's her childhood is presented as a I Love Lucy episode. Mm-hmm. You remember that part at the beginning? That's such a great idea. I couldn't believe that when I saw it. It's I mean, even though I didn't watch I Love Lucy, I kind of knew what it was all about. It was just such a dark scene, isn't it? Like, she gets abused by dad and stuff. Yeah, because I had no idea what this movie was about. So I was like, oh my God. Oh, right. You were quite shocked at that bit, were you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's shocking. It's, it's a shocking film all, all round, but um, I think that's what makes it, you know? I think it, it's known as. It's known as one of the most controversial films of all time. I was just looking at a list. Yeah, people, it seemed like they either loved it or hated it. Loved, loved it or hated it, yeah. And I think I think there are, there are a few real-life murders that were kind of linked to it. I mean, I, I say linked to it, you know, the, the people say they were inspired by it and stuff. But, you know, that, that's a whole other argument, isn't it? But... Yeah, and you mentioned like there was some kills inspired by, but I think that was the point of the movie of how we glamorize violence. I mean, you have people that are dedicated to serial killers and all these murders. And I think like this movie is still very relevant as the world is still a very violent place. Do you think that's part of the reason that this movie sustained all these years? And it's kind of a cult classic itself. Yes, it, it's certainly still relevant. I, I agree with that. Al- although I, I think it's, I don't think it's remembered as much as it should be. I, you don't really hear people talking about this film that much. But yeah, it's certainly still relevant. It's the main message of the film is about how the media kind of turns serial killers into these celebrities, like they, they make them, they make them like stars like a-list stars or something Mm -hmm. they do it for their own ratings and stuff Mm -hmm. and it it kind of exposes a uh a lack of morals with the with the media kind of thing yeah and you also mentioned tarantino did write this that could be another reason this movie is kind of still talked about in some circles because everything he touches doesn't really go away he's a phenomenal writer and director um are you a big fan of all his other movies not all of them, no. no. <laughs> like, they're not all great. <laughs> no, they're not all great, in my opinion. Um, I think his first two films, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, are masterpieces. Uh, I think they're probably his best work. And they're probably in my best film of all time, you know, my, my all-time favourites. <laughs> so back to Mallory, I recently talked about this with a podcast host named Rachel from In Slow Motion. I ta- we we're talking about her favorite like movie character crush. And then I asked her, like, do you just love the character or do you love the actor as well? And she said she does like the actor. So I wanted to know, 
your crush on Mallory, did it translate into you being like into Juliette Lewis a little bit more, like checking out more that she did? Because that's how I get if I like an actor, like a character, and I'm like, oh, they're pretty cute. I'll go watch a couple other movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I think the appeal is mainly for um, for Juliette Lewis uh, as an actor, really. I, as I say, I first saw her in Cape Fear. I, I didn't really. I didn't really fancy her that much in that film. She, you know, she's, she's quite young then anyway. But then, um, then I saw her in this, and yeah, I, th- I don't know if she's my type. Although I, I don't think I've got a type. That's the thing. I, I don't think I've got a specific type. I like all kinds of different women, I suppose. But she's 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 good. She acts well. She plays the part <laughs> well. She dance. She she got some good dance moves. She kind of looks different in in the different stages of the film as well. Have you noticed that? Mm-hmm. She, at the beginning, she's got a certain look, and then in the middle, she's got like she's got like blonde hair, and then at the end of the film, she's I think she's got short hair, hasn't she? Like short mm-hmm. black hair. I think she looks best in the middle. I think blonde might be your type then. <laughs> well. I, See, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very hard to work out. You see. <laughs> I, I've never even had a, a girlfriend with blonde hair. All of my girlfriends have had dark hair. Ah, you may have like a yeah. fantasy you got to fulfill or something. Date a blonde. <laughs> well, that's true. Maybe that's why I'm attracted to the blonde hair in the film. Yeah, that might be. Uh, you might be onto something there. <laughs> <laughs> so usually at the end of our crush portion, I ask guests to imagine their life with their crush but we can kind of assume that if you were with Mallory your life would be again very wild you'd be out there just you know taking people down so instead I want to ask you if you could cast Juliette Lewis as the lead in one of your short stories that's in your new book The Hand That Pulls You Under which one would you want her to be in and why? Right, that, that's actually quite easy. I, I, was, I was a bit worried as you were asking me this question. I thought, <laughs> no, how, how am I going to answer this? No, I, I know. It'd be story number 10 in the book. My, my, my book is a book of short stories. There are 10 stories. I, I would cast her in story number 10, which is called The House of Human Pleasures. And it's, it's an erotic story. Well, it, it's erotic and it's also violent and it's also got a bit of a sci-fi edge as well but <laughs> this um it's actually got two characters man and woman and they've kind of got this perverted sex life and they travel all, all around the world in all these different countries kind of having uh, indulging in all kinds of sexual acts with different people and it's quite it's quite near the mark this story it's pretty, it's quite it's probably the most shocking story in the book actually and i, I would yeah I, I would cast her in as a female character in this story would you want to reunite her with woody harrelson as the male lead uh yes very much, much so <laughs> <laughs> woody harrelson is great i think he plays a great part in, in natural born killers anyway and I think you would play a good part in this story. Yeah, I I didn't think of it that way. I'm glad you mentioned this. Um, I think they would both, I think you could put Mickey and Mallory in this story and it would still work. Yeah, good idea. (laughs) All right, well, now that we've cast one of your short stories, we're gonna talk more about the book. So you got a couple of books and then this release is going to be your second collection of short stories. Do you like the short story route a little bit more than writing like a full novel? I would I would think like I'm kind of that's how I would be. I'd want to write shorter ones. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. Um, I prefer short stories these days because it's well, it's less of a time commitment for a start, you know, <laughs> and um, my, my first book was a, was a full length sci-fi novel and it took me four years to write it four long, long years to write this book and it's it's just so life consuming writing a full length novel but with, with a short story you can just commit yourself to it for about two months you know that's how long it takes me to write a short story other people would, would knock a short story out in about a week even but I, I, I'd take a bit longer than that 
but it, it's a good it's a good way of writing a story because it, it's it's a lot quicker. And also, when you publish a book of short stories, you can you can fill the book up with more with more stuff, more <laughs> you know, with a lot more um, variety. Yeah, you have a lot of variety. You did sci-fi. You just told us about an erotic, violent sci-fi story. So your style's kind of a little twisted, a little dark. Did you grow up reading darker things, or were you just like into those kind of horror movies and TV shows? Like, where'd you get your influences from? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly like dark stuff, and I think one book in particular played a big part in that. When I was younger, I read Hannibal by Thomas Harris. Silence of the Lambs was the first one, but then the the sequel was Hannibal. Mm-hmm. And I, I read Hannibal when I was younger, and that, that book is really dark. You know? That's a really shocking book. And I think that kind of gave me a big taste for this stuff. Although I've, I've always been like it, I suppose, but that, that book was a big, played a big part. And all, all of my, my work is quite dark. My first book is sci-fi, but it's, it's like really dystopian and it's, it's very dark. This new one that's about to be released is it, called The Hand That Pulls You Under. It's certainly dark, but I, w- I would say the main theme of this book is absurdity. I, I'm an absurdist in life. <laughs> I, I, think, I think life is absurd. I think we've all kind of evolved by accident. I don't think there's any true meaning to life. I think that we've all just got to try and do our best and get through life uh, as best we can. And this book kind of exemplifies that. The, the subtitle of the book is Tales of Absurdity and Lunacy. And, I, and that's what the stories are like. Every story in this book kind of highlights the absurdity of life in some way or other so for example the story number one is about um it's about a a group of squatters who live in an abandoned factory and they kind of sit sit around all day getting high on these magic mushrooms that, that grow in the corners of the building and there's another story about a teenage prank gone wrong um involving like an overdose of LSD. There's another story about a self-published author who who tries to promote his book by committing a murder. Oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, these, these are the stories that you'll find in this book. Every one is, is shocking in some way. I want to, to leave the reader kind of disturbed and I just want to highlight the, the kind of absurdity of life. That's the main objective of the book, really. Well, I was going to ask you, like, I saw this, um, the nerdy narrative. Her name is Leslie Smith. She got to read The Hand That Pulls You Under a little early, and she said that she was immediately hooked reading only the first page. So what is your advice to writers out there who may be listening? Like, how do you get someone hooked on that first page? Is it shock them? Possibly, because that's what you seem to do. (laughs) Right. Well, I, my main advice would be, number one, don't, don't try to be pretentious. Mm-hmm. A lot of people, when they, when they write a book, they suddenly go into kind of sensible mode. And they think they've got to be all nice and formal and nice and stuff. I think that's a mistake. J- just write exactly what you think. Don't hold back. Don't worry about who's going to read it. Just, just be as shocking as you want just put down exactly what you want. Number two is, is um, don't worry about offending people. I, I see this a lot as well. I read a lot of books these days and they're, and they're just so bland. They're, they're, just, they're just not, you can tell the author is, is holding back because they don't want to offend this person or offend that person. Don't worry about that. Just just write exactly what you want because if, if somebody gets shocked and offended, they'll remember your book they might not like you for it but so what you know you just create your art be as shocking as you want and if people like it that's great and if they don't like it they don't like it but at least you know that you 
you've done for it and you, and you didn't hold back. Were there any like shocking stories that you had in mind that maybe you didn't put in this book that we'll see maybe in a third book of short stories later down the road? I can tell you now there's another book of short stories in the pipeline. I won't give too much away but uh, <laughs> uh, if you if you get shocked by this book, The Hand That Pulls You Under, you'll certainly get shocked by the next one. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Are you like upping it up? Are you up in the shock value? I'm just, I've reached a stage now where I'm, I'm writing, I'm putting down what's, what's going through my head. I'm, that's all I'm going to say. I can't really give away too much at this point. But, um, we'll have to stay tuned. Stay tuned. Watch this space. <laughs> and when I was thinking about these short stories, have you ever watched um, American Horror Story? Um, or heard of it? No. Uh, I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I was thinking like if your book of short stories kind of got the green light from Hollywood and was made into a series like that, would yeah. you be down for that? Like an anthology series of your short shocking stories? Totally. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be, I couldn't turn that down. It'd be too tempting, really. you know. As 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 an author, I'm I'm always trying to get people to read my books. You know, that, that's half the challenge, just trying to get your to get your work actually read. And so, um, if I got an offer like that, it would be it would be very tempting. Although I'm sure they'd want to change a lot of it. <laughs> Make loads of edits and stuff, wouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, it might be a little too shocking for TV, but who knows? They get away with a lot nowadays. So, yeah. for everyone that's listening, The Hand That Pulls You Under is available December 10th. And now you can tell people where they can find you and this collection of short stories online. Where can they find you? Right. Um, the best place to buy this book the hand that pulls you under is Amazon. You can just search for it on Amazon, or you can find it on Smashwords if you're if you're a member of Smashwords. It's also available on there. And um, the best place to find me is probably YouTube. And my my name on YouTube is at artist James Flynn, and Flynn is spelled F L Y N N. Well, James, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about your crush today. And everyone, you can find all of James' information below. And until next time, keep crushing it.